So hi, this talk is about um, Blast Shield. These are my co-authors, and obviously I should acknowledge the team back home, um, back at Microsoft, who made this possible. Um, so this talk is about um, wide area networks uh, which are controlled completely in software. And, um, and, the, and we call that software-driven WAN or SWAN for short. It's an inter-data center network, so that means it is any transfers that happen between data centers um, in our uh, backbone, uh, they go over a SWAN. SWAN is, um, a, you know, it has got, uh, so you got like, what I've shown over there is sites A through E, and there'll be data centers that's at these different sites, and right at the top of the data centers, uh, connecting into the data centers are these SWAN routers, which are commodity uh, switches which run an agent or a SWAN agent, um, and that gets its, uh, and then there is, there are controllers which are uh, sitting in data centers in different places and racks, but they are essentially programming the network in order to st uh, steer traffic that is better than what can be done with basic shortest path routing that you get with um, uh, routing protocols like so, you know, uh, existing routing, pro dynamic routing protocols that run on the network. And um, it is possible to, um, uh, to do a lot of optimization uh, to be able to direct traffic uh, based on the class of the traffic, um, based on other kinds of performance characteristics, and really get good performance, um, good utilization, and good really, um, uh, uh, like end user benefit as well. So that's SWAN. And the controller having uh, being a, a, a something that uh, looks at what's happening and doing the decision making uh, in a centralized way has a lot of benefits. You know, we've been um, running this network for building and running this network for about ten years. Um, you know, I cannot give traffic numbers, uh, but you know, there's been um, the growth just in the last four years for different reasons, for just like what's going on in the world right now, it has increased. But what I want to say is, is that it is a critical part of Microsoft's infrastructure. And uh, you know, through the years, we've built a lot of fault tolerance capabilities um, into, the, into the controller and the agent. But uh, just a few years ago, we had an incident which is kind of instructive as to, um, and the motivation for this work. So we had, um, uh, and the, the van was operating normally and through, um, there was a bug that got triggered, and this is a bug in the controller, which got triggered, which caused it to remove all the routes, optimized routes. Now the network can operate when, you know, some routes are removed or something like that, but it is of that kind of a nature, it would cause congestion, and that's what I'm showing by that red ring. So there's congestion across the network uh, triggered by the first bug. When that happens, you know, uh, traffic then goes on fallback routes, but then there was a second bug in the fallback routing, which caused the congestion to amplify. So even more people start to feel um, uh, uh, problems with their transfers and stuff like that. And this was a transient, so it uh, resolved, uh, it, it would go away in about three minutes, but then after we had a third bug that triggered which extended it for more minutes. And then afterwards, uh, it eventually, uh, and the network recovered. But when you have an outage of this kind of a global nature, um, you know, it, you, know, you have to like, take a step back. Obviously, we fixed all of the kind of the small uh, issues, uh, not the small issues, they're all large issues. But I think, you know, when we take a step back, you just see, look at why, or like at um, what, you know, this, this approach that we're taking about having centralized controllers that are doing optimization, is that the right approach for the kind of criticality that we have got on the network? So it's worth looking at the kind of traffic that we carry on our network. We carry both discretionary traffic and customer traffic. We call them tiers zero through two. And um, there's a service level objective that we have for this, and obviously tier zero, which is our customer traffic, has the highest service level objective. What I mean by service level objective is the successful transmission rate of requested bytes. And that is um, quite high for, um, for customer traffic. 
And we use this word blast radius kind of in different pieces, uh, different literature. Here, I don't mean, di by radius, I don't mean distance, but I really mean the customer traffic or the percentage of customer traffic or volume of customer traffic at risk with a control of failure. So uh, we build, uh, build blast shield as a way of um, as managing a, a large network that we have. So what I'm showing in this world map, all of those dots are our regions where we have data centers. And then all the lines that you see are um, the cable systems. The network is divided into slices, uh, and each slice has its own controllers. Um, I've shown this as an example. This is not exactly how we do it, but this is the way, this is essentially the data that I'm using in the paper. Um, a slice can be one router, it can be all routers. Usually there's something in between. It does not something that doesn't need to be all like in this contiguous, it can be spread apart. There are different ways of slicing the network, but that's an operational choice. The design doesn't uh, dictate one. The assumptions that we used and the way we went about the design was, number one, we decided to go for something that is decentralized as opposed to hierarchical. Notice we're coming from a centralized controller, which is kind of at the top of a hierarchy. And so we don't want a single point of failure or really be in a position where we are making a global change. And anything that's kind of at a hierarchy, there'd be something at the top would be a global change. And after that kind of an incident, I think it's fair to say that we cannot run a network where we do any global changes. But what we provide is that every one of those controllers has a global view. It's very easy that when you're kind of stepping out, when you're out of the network and you're sitting in, um, a, having a separate controller, you can have a global view. Second is, is that these controllers don't do any coordination because there is going to be a fault where the coordination is not working and we need a system that works. And also it's possible that these coordinations can result in some kind of bad data and we're gonna check those things and things like that. So we went about not having any coordination. But what we gave in return is, is that we generally try to create slices where the amount of inter-slice traffic is less than the amount of intra-slice traffic. And usually that's possible in a very large network. There will be places where there'll be like nodes or data centers that are talking a lot more than the ones that are a bit far away. So our controller looks like this. Controllers are, are very complex entities. Each one of these, uh, these boxes are um, a complex set of services on their own, but I think the key thing to take away from this one is that you have a, t a topology, you need, a, a, which is as everything on the left of the blue line is everything that is done globally with global knowledge. And everything on the right is that is very specific to the slice. So it makes, so every one of those controllers only makes changes to the local slice and everything on the left is kind of done with a global view. So the stuff on the left is a read, the stuff on the right is, is a write with a W. So you need topology and you have a topology service that gets the, uh, the global topology. Um, and each one of these things are completely, uh, they can do it all on their own. They don't have any dependencies with other controllers. The second one is getting global demands. Usually getting demands is quite a complex intensive piece of work. And so there's actually the left, when I say feeds, there's a lo long pipeline, but it is sharded and stuff like that. And so the demand predictor essentially gives the real time demands. And then afterwards the TE scheduler or the traffic engineering scheduler is just the one that does the optimization and all of those things that decide these are the routes to be programmed. And our route programmer is the one that does the carrying and feeding of the hardware and talks to the agents, which then afterwards installs the routes. So, um, when you saw in that figure, um, uh, the, you, the, I think the crux of the problem is how do you do inter-slice routing? How can you get traffic that is going between slices? If you can make that work, you can make everything intra-slice would automatically work. And the way we do that is every, um, it, we take up any kind of traffic engineer path is broken up into segments and each controller only programs its local slice, a, the, the part segment that transits its slice. Now, what I'm showing on the right-hand side over here is the pad that is pads that are computed by the T scheduler. And usually in this, in this example, what I'm showing is there's a, there's a single flow that is going from S to T. There are like thousands and thousands of flows, but this was one example we'll take. And A through E, those gray boxes are really the entering nodes of the, of the next slice. And the idea is this, that each slice 
programs the part segment that begin at a node in its slice and they, they go through up to the boundary or the entering node of the next slice. Each one of those things, they can be multiple hops and that is programmed purely using, uh, using MPLS. Um, the controller programs all those intermediate routers and it's able to hand the packet. So the packet enters as IP, but it can like, travel through the slice and it'll enter the next slice and it'll again become IP. And then after this, it'll continue like that. So each one of those segments get programmed by the slice controllers. Now, this is a system that is, what can happen is this, that obviously there can be a failure where a slice has, not, has removed all of its routes. You can have some of them which will just not, the routes may not be there. In that case, that slice, the packets, if it reaches that, it will not get dropped. It'll just go on the fallback route. It's, that's what I'm showing with a dashed uh, red line. Another thing is when you have controllers that are very far away, they may have inconsistent views of the topology. And there could be bugs which will cause them to be completely inconsistent, inconsistent for long periods of time. And so routing loops are avoided by these constraints that we use to restrict paths such that we achieve loop pre-routing. And there's more information on that and it's really important that we are able to do that and that's why a lot of emphasis is spent on making sure this part is correct. So we're able to do inter-slice routing. Each one of these controllers does its global optimization, figures out the stuff that's going through its slice, and then after it programs it, and then after the traffic reaches, um, uh, goes on these TE paths. Now there is a different way that can be done. Uh, source routing, if, some, if you have a network which is using segment routing, it's possible to use loose source routing and do that, where you don't need to program anything in the middle, you just program at the source and you stick a set of labels that essentially encode the path and you can send it all the way through. One of the things to um, you know, uh, watch for that is that you get good hashing performance because NPUs need to go past the labels to the L3 and the L4 header and take that in because there's usually more entropy with that and then afterwards figure out the right way of hashing. Now, we have a fleet which has got new routers, it's also got older routers. And there is, uh, the, all of these NPUs there, parser can go past a certain number of labels uh, and if there are too many labels, it cannot do that. So if you look at on uh, like our, like, in traffic engineering, one of the most important things is to be able to express, uh, to be able, is the path of computation. We want to be able to express every path or encode every path in a label stack depth that is within that par limit for the kind of things, the size of our network, and then also some of the things that we're doing, we really have a label stack depth of four that we can play with. I think somebody else who's building a network now has a brand new network with newer NPUs, they can go further. But in our case, because it's only right before. So that's the reason why we do not choose this, but this is a perfectly interesting approach. The other one is this, that when you use something like this, you make taking a greater dependence on ISIS or some kind of an IGP, versus our interslice of routing does not need that. It uses that only as fallback. Now, the key part about all of this stuff is our TE scheduler. So I just want to show a bit more about that. I want to switch from how things work on the data plane to how we do engineering uh, and optimization. We compute paths online. And I was saying, a lot of traffic engineering is about really doing good exploration of paths. And we use um, max, max flow algorithms and various ways of finding diverse paths. It's called like penalizing uh, pathfinder and things. Then we collect a set of paths. And I told you there are constraints. These constraints, if one were to use source routing, it would be this label stack constraints. And if it were using inter-slice routing, which we do, is those interleave constraints. It takes away a few of the paths that can be used. And that will, but that's okay. And we take those paths, and then afterwards we do the optimization. Our tier zero traffic gets standard stuff, is that we are trying to max, do maximum fairness or approximate maximum fairness, give the most amount of, and then afterwards, after that, we have the tier zero also has to be on the shortest latency paths. And they need to be diverse protection. So there's a lot of things to be done. We do that for tier zero. Tier one and two, we try and keep them away, which is off from the tier zero. We do put them on like links which have got um, you know, underutilized so that they don't contend on the same queues as or like on congested links. So we do this kind of optimization and then afterwards, 
Everything that I showed you right now, every one of our controllers would do exactly the same thing, same input. The route generator is the one that only figures out, does a transformation and figures out just the routes that need to be programmed. What is nice about this is that you can have all of these controllers doing about the same thing. You can start from someplace very small and you'll still get exactly the same. Um, you know, you can get um, a good, uh, I'll, I'll show, you can get good, uh, they will do exactly the same thing, which means that it has some benefits in deployment. Now, one of the things is that when you have this, the thing that I showed you in the optimization, there's some amount of noise. You, they're not coordinated. It can be that they will kind of like, um, they may not give exactly the same kind of weights and things like that. And in our experiment, so this data, what I'm showing is about 30 days of things running in production where you've got everybody's computing the, the weights that need to be placed on parts and seeing how close are they to each other. And the one on the right is the one that we care about. It's about like 3% of the traffic is kind of not exactly aligned in terms of the, how each controller is deciding what to do. Now 3% is, you know, it's, you know, it's well within what we need. We, we have a small wiggle room that we play with. We set aside a scratch capacity on links of around 15%. So when there's a small amount of deviation, which is anyway likely to be the case because you cannot really predict demands as accurately, there are different kinds of things that happen on the network. This is well within what we are trying to achieve. Now, blast radius reduction. Yes, we do get, this is how um, blast radius reduction works. What I'm showing is that I'm taking, starting with one slice, and that is, if it were to fail, traffic would go to um, fallback routing, and that there'll be a certain amount of congestion. And that's what I showed with this point one. You can see about 10% of tier zero traffic, and about 18% of our tier one and two traffic, they'd be congested. When you go to four slices, and this is, I've shown the slice, the way it is sliced over there, uh, it has some nice things, but it's the, the biggest slice is still large, so it's about the same amount of congestion. When we go to slice six, that's when we have broken up our kind of a large slice into, um, into three, and there it starts to drop, and then we can go a bit further with that. So that is the kind of like reduction that we get, but there's more benefit than just the reduction that we get. Change is riskiest when it's first deployed, and it's possible to do a safe deployment where you deploy on the small slices. And notice I showed you the T scheduler doing roughly the same thing everywhere, it is the same, and that gives that benefit of like testing the same thing even in very small blast radiuses. And so you can decrease the probability that you have a failure in a, in a large one. And finally, applications, when, it is, when they have to fail out, they have the option to fail out when you don't have global impact. And that's where when, the kind of the, when you make the blast radius small, or at least contained, it has an option. So that's what we have, we have that's the sum, uh, so in summary, we, how our network is divided into slices. We use a decentralized approach. It has benefits of decreasing the blast radius, and by keeping that inter-slice traffic low, we're able to um, uh, deal with a small amount of inefficiency that comes. That's it, questions?